We're really pleased to introduce today's speakers. A husband and wife team, Paul Guinan and Aminah Bennett, have been making up stories together since 1989, when they created the groundbreaking science fiction comic, Heartbreakers. I should note they're also featured in the exhibit, so just in case you didn't notice that. Aminah is a writer, former comic book editor, and founding board member of Friends of Lulu, a 1990s nonprofit that works to get more women involved in comics. Paul has illustrated and written stories for various comic book publishers, co-created chronos for DC Comics, and co-founded Heliosope Studio, the nation's biggest collective of comic book creators. It's a place right here in Portland. The couple's most recent books are two unique and critically acclaimed illustrated hardcovers, Boilerplate, History's Mechanical Marvel, and Frank Reed, Adventures in the Age of Innovation. Their work, as I noted, is featured in the exhibit, and their books are available for sale in our museum store, where you can use your member discount. So make sure to take advantage of that opportunity today. Please join me in welcoming Anina and Paul. Thank you, Eliza. Hopefully, hopefully I'll look better later. Thank you, Eliza. And I also want to thank the Oregon Historical Society for putting together this excellent exhibit, Comic City USA. For people watching online, um, the other people who haven't seen the exhibit yet, it focuses on uh, different types of cartooning and animation. So the exhibit isn't just about comic books, it's about comic books, cartooning, and animation, and various different people who uh, have accomplished great things in those fields who've lived in Oregon. What we're going to focus on today is the comic book part of that, because that's the part that, that, uh, that we know more about. And the comic book industry uh, and the medium have seen really massive, massive changes in the last few decades um, since we got into the business. So um, we're going to be, uh, I think we can skip the part where we introduce ourselves, because Eliza already did that for us. Um, so these are, some of the, these are some of our books that are, some of which are available in the gift shop. Um, and before we, before we launch into uh, the, the meat of the presentation, um, I just want to have a little matter of terminology to get it straight. Um, so there's definitely a close relationship between comic strips and comic books, and Stone Soup is a comic strip that's featured in this exhibit, uh, but they're not exactly the same medium. So a comic book, um, as you can see, the, the Archie uh, uh, pages that we're showing up there, a comic book is usually multiple pages, pages of what is often referred to as sequential art or sequential still images, as opposed to a comic strip, which is usually a few panels that might be serialized or might be a gag strip. Um, we often get asked what's the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel, and there's actually not a big difference except for the format. So usually a graphic novel, like Mouse up there, is square bound, so it's got a square spine, like you know, like a paperback or, or a book, um, and it's very often a, a full self-contained story. So as opposed to uh, a comic book that has a staple spine, which we sometimes call floppy comics. Um, and those are very often serialized stories. So that's really the only difference between a comic book and a graphic novel. Graphic novel is a term that came along in the 80s um, during the period that we're going to be talking about. So the world that we live in today uh, is a world where uh, a lot of people consider it, maybe don't even read comics, consider it fun to dress up like superheroes or like comic book characters. Uh, and the, the comic book conventions are a huge business. You see them on the international news now. Movie companies are making blockbuster movies based on comic books. The Walking Dead is a TV show that's been running for years that's based on comic book. And it seems like comic books are just really cool now and they're everywhere. That was not the world of 20 to 30 years ago when we got into comics. No, in fact, actually when, uh, when I was a kid, the idea of telling somebody that I was interested in comics, let alone that I wanted to draw them, would have provided the meeting. That was just not for me. Um, so we're gonna so we're gonna look at how did we get how did we get here over the last 30 years. And to do that, we're gonna go a little further back in time at first. Uh, back to the gold, what's called the golden age of comics. So we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is just to point out things that led up to the period that we're going to be talking about. So in the golden age of comics, uh, comic books sold millions, some of them sold millions of copies. The sales figures were very high, and there were all different kinds of genres out there. So if 
you know, if you know anybody who was reading comics in the 40s, they would have been reading, you know, and practically anything, romance, westerns, science fiction, uh, all different kinds of genres. It's a, it's a little known fact that and during World War II, any given U.S. platoon of about six men would have one guy who would have the stash of comics. That was, a, that was, was huge. That's right. They were, they were very popular among, uh, among servicemen, and the U.S. Army did educational material in comic book form, and so did the U.S. government, as well as various public service type announcements. So it was a hugely popular medium that grew out of pulp novels of the 19th, pulp novels and dime novels of the 19th century. But then, something happened in the mid-20th century. And so during the Golden Age, uh, in addition to all those other genres, this new genre came along of superheroes, which I think we're probably all familiar with now. It usually means a caped costume, not always caped, but a costume character who has some kind of metahuman abilities, right? And there were characters like that before, but it was sort of a, a gradual evolution that then took off in the Golden Age with the, with the advent of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and characters like that. And these characters, uh, Batman, Superman, were coming out of a tradition of pulp magazines at the time. There was uh, characters like Doc Savage and The Shadow. Batman is, is quite often, uh, they describe The Shadow as being one of uh, Batman's major inspirations. So uh, so we did have superhero genres during the Golden Age, but by the time you get to the Silver Age, there had been this event, uh, the 50s Red Scare. And uh, so there was the Hollywood 10, there was writers and artists being blacklisted right and left, and it did not escape the comics industry. There was an actual congressional hearing it was held on how comic books were corrupting America's youth. And, uh, Not so much because of communism, though. It was, it, there was one guy in particular named Frederick Ritham who was driving a lot of that, but there was, it was a general climate at the Right. Time. This guy, Frederick Ritham, was a psychologist who wrote a book that basically lambasted comics for being a bad influence. And um, so as a result, comic book publishers got really nervous, and so a lot of them dropped their more controversial titles of crime comics, um, uh, horror comics, anything that, that would um, that would freak out a parent. And as a result, uh, industries narrowed themselves to safe genres. So animal comics, cartoon like ghosts, uh, and superheroes. These were considered to be things that were not controversial and that, uh, that they could publish in safety. In fact, one company, uh, EC Comics, completely went out of business because all they published was crime, horror, and war comics, and they couldn't survive, although one branch of their talent field, uh, the humor branch, went off and did uh, what became that magazine. So that was the vestigial elements of that era. So there were other factors that contributed to this as well, um, but we could do an, an entire day's presentation on that probably. So, uh, but the, the, and the net effect was that in the 50s and 60s, the, the, the vast range of genres that was available earlier really started to narrow down. And there were still a few things that weren't superheroes or, or uh, you know, funny animal or kids comics, but really the bulk of the stuff that was being published at the time that Paul and I started reading comics as kids was superheroes and comics aimed at, at kids. Archie's, Harvey's, um, was, I, I think those were the two main ones at the time. And, and comic books really developed this public perception at the time that they were all for kids. So the entire industry kind of went from being a mass medium that everybody read, all different ages of people read comics in the golden age, to being something that was thought of as being for kids, even though there were still people of all different ages uh, reading them. And they also uh, became a little harder to get. So when you think of comic books now, a lot of people are probably uh, familiar with the comic shop of today, right? Uh, there are comic book stores, they exist as specialty stores, you can go in, you can find all different kinds of comic books and graphic novels, sometimes statues and other things related to the comics. Well, those didn't exist until the 1970s. So during the Golden Age and the beginning of the Silver Age, uh, that spinner rack photo on the top there, that's where most people, that's how most people got their comics. You either got them there, you got them at the drugstore, you got them at the grocery store. If you were really a diehard, you might subscribe to them. Um, so they went from being very widely available at newsstands all over the place to being relatively hard to find, only in isolated places and in places where, uh, where kids might have a few minutes to check out the spinner rack. Um, so in the 60s, the first comic book specialty shops started to crop up. 
and uh, a lot of them looked not as good as the one that's in that photo, um, all the way up to the 90s probably. Um, that's actually, uh, at the time, this, this is a shop in North Hollywood, California, Hollywood, California, that I believe at the time was considered the largest comic shop in the, in the country. Um, and it was also one of the earliest ones. Um, that would be the size of an average show. This was also the era when the comic book conventions that we know as sort of vast and glitzy events started out, and they didn't look like that then. They looked like that picture. They looked like a little bit more like a flea market, right? Yeah, now at this time, one of the organizers of, of these early proto comic book conventions, uh, this man named Phil Sinley, he decided to start distributing comics. He loved them so much, and so he set up this tiny little distribution company that gave uh, a new opportunity for publishers, uh, whereas it, you know, what, they, what we now refer to as the direct market system. So the deal with it was, prior to his idea, you would have you would print up a run of comics that were returnable, so you'd send them to the newsstands, and then if they didn't sell them, you would have to eat that. Uh, they would send back the unsold copies, and this still exists in the bookstore market. Right. So, so this guy came with this idea that if if you could tailor your print runs, you would save a lot of money. Uh, you would know your customers, you could start building up a, a base, a database of uh, fan base. And so he started, he started this, this little distribution company using a non returnable system. So retailers would get a solicitation from a publisher saying, we're going to do this book, here's what it looks like, how many copies do you have? And the retailer would order a certain number, and the publisher could print to that number and save himself a lot of money. And so that started, started out as a very restless thing, and then started to really pick up speed in the 80s. And whereas before you would have to go into like a, either a, a drugstore or like in my case, I remember as a kid, go, uh, the other places I could find comic books were poster shops, weird collectible stores that sold all kinds of funny curios. And then every once in a while, a particularly must be used bookstore that would have a cardboard box underneath the table that you could go through. Yeah, sure, kid, go ahead, buy as many as you want. So. And Paul, I think you started going to comic book conventions before I did. So do you recall the early days of the conventions at all? The first San Diego Comic Con, the San Diego Comic Con started in the 70s, but the first one I went to was in 87, and it looked like that. I mean, it was not too far away. It was, it was still a 73 to 87 was a difference, but by the, by the first Comic Con I went to in San Diego, they didn't have uh, uh, booths, they didn't have giant banners, they had people on tables, just set up on tables. And if you were against the wall, maybe you could put up a little graphic behind you. And that was it. They were, they were really very simple, stripped down things, and only hardcore comic book fans would go with them. And they started out as kind of really a swap network because comics were hard to find, and there was no internet yet, of course, so you couldn't go on the internet to buy your back issues if you were missing something. Right. Um, and collectibles didn't exist the way that they do now, so they didn't have who was selling action figures and all these characters. That, that didn't exist. So I think unbeknownst to everyone at the time in the 70s, um, when Phil Sewling, the guy that Paul was talking about, came up with this new distribution method, um, it, it basically started opening the floodgates. So not just the floodgates for, for retail stores, but also retail stores, but also for conventions. So in a way, this guy is very unsung. There's just really no, no real book about him. But here, this, this one guy pretty much is the father oh, of the, the modern the retail kind of shop and the modern kind of convention. Okay, so flash forward to the 70s when uh, Paul and I are both starting to go to comic book shops. I think that's when I first found out that comic book shops even existed. Um, and they really were, they were heavily dominated by Marvel and DC, which are the two big superhero publishers and still are today. And they still tend to dominate the comic book shops. Yeah, the reason they dominated is because the industry imploded and only started just being superhero titles. So for a few decades, Marvel and DC sort of had free reign, you know, a free market, an open market to just dominate the superhero genre. And so they, there, were other so the there were other publishers, but as a kid, this is more or less what the comic book uh, you know, industry looked like to us when we went into comic book shops. It was Marvel and DC and not much else. Then, at the same time that all this stuff was going on, people were starting uh, to open comic book stores, they were starting to do these little conventions, the new distribution system started up. At the same time, there was a group of people who were starting to do underground comics in the 1960s. And they were, in a way, a reaction to the kind of dulling down of superhero comics during that same period. Because these were people like Robert Crumb, 
who is now world famous, but at the time was fairly obscure, brilliant cartoonist, but he had no interest in doing that kind of cartooning that the, that the, the major superhero publishers were doing. Didn't like those stories, didn't want to draw like that. And so, you know, he and a bunch of other people uh, started doing their own stories. And it's called the underground because they weren't sold in major retail establishments. Basically, they weren't at the time sold in the same places that comic books were sold in. They were sold in places like weird record stores and head shops and that musty box, you know, behind the counter or under the counter at some oddball independent bookstore. Um, so they were even harder to find. And the first two official underground publishers that started in the 70s were Kitchen Sink and Last Gasp. Both, well, Kitchen Sink is no longer around, but Dennis Kitchen, who founded it, is still around. Last Gasp is still around primarily as a, uh, a book sales company now. So these really kind of these companies and the underground cartoonists really paved the way for an explosion of new types of publishers that came along in subsequent decades. So that started in the 70s, at around the same time that Phil Sewing set up his new distribution network, which made it easier for these new comic book specialty shops to order the comics they wanted, because they didn't have to go through the big, giant newsstand distributors, and they didn't have to you know, worry about, if, you know, uh, the publisher didn't have to worry about getting those returns anymore. Um, so more and more comic shops started springing up, and between this and the new types of publishing that are going on, in the 70s, you get, you get another wave. This is really the first wave of what we call independent publishers and small press and self-publishers in, in comics in the, in the latter part of the 20th century. And independent in comics is kind of a, it's a really squishy term that doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like how people used to talk about independent record labels. It just means they're, usually it means they're smaller and they're not the big gargantuan ones that have been there for decades, right? So. These, uh, these, these other ones are some of the earliest um, self-publishers and independent publishers. And the, the Wolfhead graphic um, is Work Graphics, which was a company founded by Wendy and Richard Peeney, um, who were among the very earliest self-publishers. And they have been doing a book called ElfQuest on and off for many years. Um, they were really groundbreaking uh, in, in the fact that they did it themselves. They're now concluding the series with Dark Horse Comics, which is located here in Oregon. Um, but they and some of the other people who started publishing these types of things in the 70s also established the idea that the people who make the comics should maybe own the stories and the artwork and the characters that they created. Because all the stuff that was published by Marvel and DC and uh, the Disney comics that Carl Barks drew for, some of which there's examples of them in the exhibit, um, none of those artists owned their work. None of the writers owned the characters that they created. The publishers owned all of it. And in the early days, Sometimes the creative team wasn't even credited, right? People didn't know who Karl Marx was for decades. He was the good duck artist. It took a long time for people to find out his name, and I'm glad that he eventually got his due while he was still alive. Yeah, it took um, Stan Lee in the 1960s with Marvel Comics to start developing this cult of personality around the talent that was producing these books. So you get this, first you get the undergrounds, then you get this wave of independent and self-publishers in the 70s. Um, and then the direct sales market really starts to kick in, and there are also a bunch of changes in printing and technology that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And uh, the concept of creator ownership starts to become more sought after in the creative community. And so more publishers start springing up in the 80s. And most of them, not all of them, but many of these publishers um, followed a creator ownership model, and they started attracting fresh new talent, and they started getting some talent away from the bigger publishers as well. Actually, this is where I began my career. At First Comics was a comic company that opened up in Chicago. And at that time, I, I, I was in art school, and I didn't have the ambitions to go draw comic books because of the domination of Marvel and DC. I wasn't interested in doing superhero work. But because I started seeing, uh, because, I, because of this company that opened up in, uh, in my hometown, I, I picked up some of their uh, issues in this really blunt way about how, oh wow, these guys aren't doing superheroes, they're doing everything else but. And I got excited to, 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 to I sort of re-examined my uh, childhood dream of becoming a comic artist. I said, oh, okay, there's other opportunities. Things were starting to open up. Yeah, so for us, this happened at, I think, right around the time that we were both starting to get 
kind of bored with reading mainstream superhero comics because when you read them for decades, they get a little repetitive after a while. You'll start to notice some of the same you know, storylines and character dynamics over and over again. So we're getting a little bored with that, and right around the time that we would have otherwise lost interest in comics, oh my god, comics got really exciting. And it just kept building from there. And if you had told me uh, back in the early 80s uh, that there would someday, I would be standing here in an exhibit at a historical society in Oregon talking about the history of comics, I would have, I would have like, I would have thought you were, you know, like you were on acid or something. <laughs> so, uh, so this was a very exciting time in the 80s when, uh, especially if you were sort of not so much interested in the superhero stuff anymore, all of a sudden all these new publishers started cropping up and they were doing different genres again. A lot of it was still kind of coming out of the pulp traditions and some of the same type of superhero-ish characters, but with a really different twist. And as the publishers proliferated, so did the different types of content. Um, and you can see uh, the Dark Horse logo up there. Uh, Dark, so Paul and I both started at First Comics in the late 80s. Um, and then uh, I wound up um, working at Dark Horse as an editor in the early 90s, which is what brought us out here, which is why we've been in Oregon for 25 years. Um, and Dark Horse is one of this early round of um, independent publishers that was formed in the 80s, and they're celebrating their 30th anniversary this year. So well done, Dark Horse. Um, and this really actually accelerated in the 90s, surprisingly to some. Um, so in the 90s, even more new publishers started cropping up. And what started happening here was that people who had read the interesting new underground and self-published uh, and creator-driven stuff in the 70s and 80s are now founding publishing companies. They're now forming new publishing companies. They're buying scripts at movie studios. They're book buyers. They're making decisions at book publishing houses. So this is the period during which it seemed like almost suddenly there was increased public acceptance of comic books and you started seeing, seeing them in a lot of different places. Um, and in fact, IDW up there, um, that company was founded by uh, Ted Adams, who used to work at Dark Horse. So there's a lot of tendrils that spread out from those early, from those early comics and that, that really like knit the whole industry together. Um, so uh, this actually got the attention of Marvel and DC to the point that they launched their own alternative imprints. So these, lot, these three logos under Marvel, those are all Marvel and DC imprints. They did some very interesting stuff, but they felt the need to brand it differently because they were so heavily associated with superhero comics, but they were like, hey, there's this like alternative thing going on. Like, we should, maybe we should do something yeah. like that, but we can't put, do it under Marvel. So at the same time that all this is going on, manga is starting to gain in popularity in the United States. What's that? We have to use that PDF, otherwise this would be all animated and cute. Um, so at the same time, manga uh, translated mostly Japanese comics is starting to build in popularity at first slowly and then very quickly in the U.S. Yeah, when I was at uh, First Comics, uh, I, I started out as a, a production artist. Uh, I was just thrilled by the idea that I was living in a town that had a comic company, and I went, I brought my portfolio over there, and I. I was lucky enough to get a gig, and uh, just doing touch-ups and little production things. When you know, when pages get sent in, sometimes there's more mistakes, or, or they need to be shot back then, shot on film to be made ready for the for the printers. So I, I was I was um, I was a staff artist, and first time I got the very first manga license ever. It was for a book called Lone Wolf and Cub about a samurai, a wandering samurai and his little boy, and we were in charge of doing translations and redoing the art. Now this is a brand new thing. We didn't know how to approach it, but we had the edict that uh, the samurai had to be still right-handed. So we couldn't just flop the pages, because as you, as you may or may not know, in Japan, they're reading the opposite direction, so you're actually going from back to front, from our perspective, in reading comics. So we didn't just want to flip the things, because otherwise the samurai would be left-handed. So we had to rearrange the panels individually. And it was a huge laborious process. I had to go in all, all analog with white out, white out the Japanese sound effects, replace the art that was now whole. But not on the original art. No, on the for stand, 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 stand. And uh, and then no digital and then re photograph them, and then they were published. Now, as the manga thing started to accelerate, people started getting more familiar with the idea of reading in what we think of as a backward order or opposite a direction. 
And so then publishers started to let go of this idea of having to rearrange panels, and they just started to just uh, print them in mirror. And that went on for a while. That was also true things on. Meaning they would just flop the page so that you could read it. So you could read it correctly, yeah, from our, from our perspective. Um, but then, uh, to these men, actually, uh, to today, manga has become uh, so accepted among, among its readers that they don't have to do that anymore. You can publish it as it was published. You don't have to do translations to the blues, but you can, you, uh, modern readers today won't read from the left side to the right side. Yeah, and that's pretty recent. So manga in the 19th, so manga, for those who don't know, it's not a specific style of art necessarily. It just means, it's just a Japanese word for comic books. So they tend to have, uh, they tend to have a different art style in general than American comics, but there's now been so much cross-cultural influence that you can't really tease them apart anymore. Um, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean the characters are always drawn in a certain way or that there's always certain types of stories. And in fact, one of the advantages that manga had at the time that they started translating and publishing them in the United States is that they were publishing all different kinds of stories. They weren't locked down into superheroes or one or two genres. So there was tons of material, there was decades worth of material available in all these different genres. Yeah, like golf comics, the exciting panel by panel drama of a guy putting. <laughs> so, so at first in the 70s and the 80s, it was just sort of dribs and drabs. A few translated manga would come out here and there. Late 80s, it absolutely took off because at about exactly the same time, First Comics started publishing Lone Wolf and Cub, which was ultimately completed in translated form by Dark Horse. Um, and uh, Marvel, through their epic line, started publishing Akira, which got a lot of attention, which was a very popular manga series, and there was also an animated movie and anime. And, and actually, the technology of, of, of anime, which was which is Japanese animation, um, VCRs started to be a cheap uh, consumer product in the 80s, and all of a sudden, animation clubs started popping up. Yeah, so for a long time there was actually, this is a tangent, but for a long time there was actually an underground of people who would do the, their own uh, translations of manga, and they would pass around the translations on the, like on the, in the early days of the internet, um, until more translated versions started becoming available. Um, so the next thing that happens in manga is that a bunch of the publisher, a bunch of the existing independent publishers start their own manga lines. There's actually a pretty huge boom in manga in the 90s. And then this company called Tokyo Pop comes along and like pushes it up a ramp and then eventually down over a cliff. Um, but Tokyo Pop was the company that started publishing manga in the in, in the original page layouts, and they did that largely to save on production costs because the kind of stuff Paul was doing was very labor intensive and time consuming and expensive. So they were like, hey, maybe if we just publish it the way it is, but with English, we can get the kids to read it. And their audience was very young, for the most part, and they were very flexible, and they were, and they thought it was cool to read it that way, because it was more like reading the Japanese version. So that is now much more common than it used to be. That didn't exist at all in the 80s when manga would be published in the US. Um, so the manga revolution, combined with several other things, uh, manga really brought in a whole new audience. So in addition to some of the uh, underground and independent and arts, art stuff that was going on at the time, manga not only brought in a new audience, but it, helped, it really helped open up the bookstore market to comic books. At the time, that was seen as that was seen as a bit of a that was seen as sort of like the holy grail for a lot of comic book publishers because even though the direct sales market had in some ways saved comic books, it had also kind of limited it to only operating within these certain types of stores in this certain distribution system. So as new publishers started cropping up, publishing a wider variety of material again, they started thinking, boy, if only we could get this stuff into bookstores. We know people people would buy it. People would buy it. People would buy it. People would buy it. But one of the limiting factors was that graphic novels at the time were almost all a uniform size, and they did not fit, and they did not fit on paperback bookshelves. Manga did. So between this and some of the commercial cloud that the manga publishers had, uh, graphic novels were just starting to be shelved in bookstores. Manga really, really helped kick the door open. Um, so it made a huge difference in expanding the audience for comics in the United States, bringing a lot of female readers into uh, the comic book fold, and also opening up the bookstore market. So this is just a quick summary of uh, approximate numbers of publishers that were founded in the United States by decade during the period that we're talking about. And so this, I, I looked this up because I wanted to confirm my own 
you know, anecdotal experience, basically. And these numbers are approximate, but I think they're relatively close. And you can see that not only is there a huge spike in, it starts to go up in the 70s, huge spike in the 80s, and then the 90s just like, all of a sudden, everybody formed a comic book company. Actually, you can see the chilling effect in the 50s of the, uh, of this tirade against comics corrupting our youth. Yeah, and there was a postcard. We shut that down a little bit there. So, so uh, because of this new distribution system, because of all this, you know, these new creators coming into it, because of this new approach to storytelling again, we started to get really interesting alternative and even interesting variations on what were traditional superhero genres. So, in the upper left, the first graphic novel to ever win the Pulitzer Prize, uh, the st story of memoir of uh, of, of uh, Art Spiegelman's family and, uh, and their Holocaust experience. And that seems like an intense subject, probably Tame too. He did this really genius uh, choice of making the Jews mice and the Nazis cats uh, to help to help make it easier for somebody to even pick up a comic book about the Holocaust. And that story, before it was published as a graphic novel, was serialized in a magazine called Raw, uh, which was doing a lot of very, very interesting uh, alternative comics at the time. And so it was coming out all through the 80s, even though it wasn't actually published in graphic novel form until the early 90s, at which point it won a Pulitzer. Uh, the one next to it, uh, American Flag. This is kind of an unsung title that a lot of uh, people, uh, regardless of the ground making or major account, but for artists and designers, it absolutely is. It was like an atomic bomb in the industry. Uh, this guy, Howard Chapin, uh, did this entirely new approach to storytelling with, with, with the way that the page was laid out, the way he designed it. Some of, some of the pioneering stuff he did was done by um, a guy named Jim Strangle in the 60s who did some psychedelic stuff. Kirby had done some weird psychedelic stuff, but Chapin, for the first time, did this, what we would, uh, if you're familiar with Chris Ware, some of Chris Ware's work, a series of panels that, that, were, that created more of a cinematic kind of effect, storytelling-wise, and yet enhanced the concept of designing a page so that it's not just movie panels that you're looking at. You're looking at an art, but you're looking at the page itself as a piece of art. And this book so influenced the industry. In fact, um, American Flag was the design influence for one of the biggest hits of the 80s, uh, uh, Dark Knight, uh, which, was, which was just recently turned into a not so great superhero movie. American Flag uh, was from First Comics, the, one of the, the, the 80s wave, and it was also super raunchy, and it was basically like like kind of semi dystopian science fiction. Right, I, actually, just a quick sidebar one of the things about the 1950s, because of this backlash about comics, is that the industry sort of self censored, censored themselves with this thing called the Comics Code Authority, which they themselves made up. And it was like a little tiny like stand with a little serrated edge that would be on all the comics saying this is approved by the Comics Code Authority. By this time, with the new distribution system. So you're still so talking to hurt your kids. Right. Okay. So but with this new distribution system, you didn't have to worry about newsstands and, and the more public facing comics. Now that they were kind of were, could be found in pet shops and stuff, you can do some more adult things with them. So uh, that code started to disappear. It started to leave the comics. And, and these first, these, these uh, 80, 80s books, Watchmen, Dark Knight, and some of these, were a reaction to that uh, loosening of the code. It's very, very similar in Hollywood, where in the 1970s you have Peck and Paw, these filmmakers all of a sudden are showing the effects of a you know, gun hit. Yeah, and sort of similar to the underground cartoon, is there were a lot of artists and writers who were just like, well, I want to do something different. Do superhero comics always have to be silly? You know, because they got very silly for a while in the 60s. Right, because because they were regarded as a children's medium. So, so when all this other stuff starts happening, all this cool, interesting underground alternative comics start happening, the superhero people were going, hey, we want to. We want to express ourselves in unusual and interesting ways like that, but unfortunately, one of the things that they, the tack that they, a lot of writers decided to take is, is just make the comics darker, just make the themes darker, make the, the, the sequences more violent. Yeah, so so we were treated to a, a vast wave of superhero comics in the 90s that, that a lot of people in the industry refer to as the grim and greedy years. Um, because, well, look, this is how we prove that comics are grown up. Comics aren't just for kids now, right? we got to make them like violent and mean, you know? And, uh, and that unfortunately resulted in a dearth of comics for younger readers for quite a while. So it had an ironic uh, chilling effect on it because new people weren't coming in, new readers weren't coming into the industry except for manga. That was really the main 
avenue for new younger readers to be coming in at the time. So we kind of almost lost a generation of people, I think, because of that. Um, so these works were, uh, so some of these superhero books were very groundbreaking at the time, but they, they spawned so many imitators that it became really, it became very wearying after a while. The superhero books all got very dark and very, very tortured and horrible things happened to Batgirl and she couldn't, you know. I didn't even want to put that one in here, that's sort of what I called the killing joke. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, the killing yeah. joke was uh, Dark Knight, uh, they, these are uh, all turned into movies, and one of the reasons that they're so, <laughs> like, especially Batman Superman was so unbelievably dark was because it was based on an 80s comic from what we call the Grim and Gritty period. So. So we're necessarily giving you a pretty high, quick overview of a lot of stuff. There's probably hundreds of titles we could have put up there, but these are meant to be representative of stuff that came out in the in the 80s that had a huge uh, ripple effect on the industry and on the next generation of creators as well. Like for instance, on the far right, Love and Rockets and Like I said, were some of the first to really break through mainstream, or books that, that broke into some kind of mainstream acceptance that were just soap operas. They were just about people living their lives in a city, you know, just having, which was a weird concept in comics at the time. I mean, that's what an awful lot of literature is about, but comics were so dedicated to genre fiction for so long that that there just hardly anyone had done comics like that. I think really probably Will Eisner, um, the grand master of comics, was the only person I can think of who had done those types of stories. Just straight in drugs with not a superpower character. Yeah, there are some superpower characters in Love and Rockets, but yes. it's an anthology title. Yeah. It's wonderful, by the way. Yes. Um, it's one of my favorites. So, so, so all this stuff happens in the in the eighties and nineties, uh, and there is then at one point it proves to be a little too much. There's an implosion in the nineties. We uh, we lost one of the two major distributors in the comic book industry. We lost a lot of retailers, and we lost a number of publishers. So all those publishing numbers up there, all those publishers aren't still in existence. A lot of them went out of business uh, not too long after they were formed. And so it doesn't mean that like, there's like cumulatively now 500 comic book publishers, although it seems like that sometimes. Because the 80s explosion of a new distribution system, new talent, new approaches to the medium, created a bubble. Uh, people then started getting carried away, printing variant covers. This cover's got a silver foil. This is the special, special, special edition. So you have to buy all four of them. And, and so, and, and, and fans started getting caught up in that. So they bought, like, they buy one to put in the package and put in their basement. They buy one to read. They buy one for this. And that was unsustainable. Yes, it was a bit of a boom and bust thing. Um, but during this entire time, the other thing that had been happening is that librarians and educators had really started to get behind comics. So between them and some of the new audiences that were coming in, the new distribution system, new bookstore acceptance, and new generations of people raised on those independent comics, this boom actually just continued despite the contraction of the 90s. So in the first decade of the 2000s, we had even more publishers coming in. And, uh, and in the 90s, one of the things that started happening in addition is that uh, you started to get uh, a new wave of corporate money coming in because people saw what had happened with some of the self-started uh, independent publishers in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and the other thing that happened in the early 2000s that had a big impact on the industry and on public acceptance of comics was book publishers started doing graphic novels. So those are those last two are all imprints by major book publishers that now publish graphic novels that are very highly regarded and that actually in some cases sell pretty well. Um, and have, that have also brought in another set of new readers to, uh, to comic books. So we've gone from you know the narrowing down effects in the mid 20th century to really the whole industry opening back up over the course of the last three decades. Um, so it's been a very exciting period, and even though comic book sales are not where they were um, overall in the golden age, uh, they are they are currently trending upward every year. And right now, in 2015, the annual sales uh, for the North American comic book industry were estimated at more than one billion dollars. And there's some cases where if you go look at trade journal or trade industry trades where you really give um, uh, figures for comic book publishing. Those are for the kind of uh, direct market system. There's some publishers that uh, do far better than any of their titles by selling them in the book industry, which isn't counted. So, some, so there's some skewed numbers yeah. that, keep it, that make it confusing. All right, but enough about sales figures. That's boring. <laughs> 
so this is where we are now. This is what a Comic-Con Comic -Con looks like today. Compare that to the 1973 photo that we had earlier. And this is, this is the big one that they show on all the news. But even the local and regional Comic-Cons have all been growing so fast that they look to almost as crowded as that when, when you go to them. And they have all different kinds of things in them now. If, you, if you've seen them covered in the media, you've probably seen they have people doing cosplay. Well, there's an interesting feedback loop that was caused by the media reporting on Comic-Con Because that's kind of the convention started to populate. You know, you would have local reporters, oh, there's this thing going on this weekend at the, at the such and such hall. And they would take their cameras down there. And of course, like in political protests, when you have a camera crew, they're looking for the visual thing. So they would shoot the people who, the couple few people, two or three people that dressed up in costume for that convention. And they would get the footage. So then this feedback loop started to create where people who weren't familiar with conventions and would see it on TV would see it as like, oh, it's like a costume party kind of thing also. So they, so they would go the way that I would go to a flea market. Uh, I'm not going to buy anything, but if I do see something, it will be interesting. In the meantime, you know, I'll have a hot dog, I'll keep watching. So comic conventions started to turn into cosplay slash flea market things. So just recently, there's been this schism between what are now referred to in the industry as pop cons, comic book conventions that have comics and toys and collectibles and, movies, and, and posters, and, et cetera, et cetera. And then what are called comic fests, which are focused on the publishing, the creators, the artists, writers. And the, the latter tend to be smaller, and they tend to be a little bit more like a, a, like a literary festival. Very reader driven. Um, so if you're looking for events to attend in, you know, in, in your, uh, your local uh, venues, um, that's what the distinction is. So if you see something that's called a festival, it's likely to be smaller. You might, uh, you're going to see different types of artists there than you, go, than you would see at a comic book convention. So, the rise of the direct sales market and all this other stuff that we were talking about is certainly not the only thing that has uh, has uh, spawned some of these changes and uh, accelerated some of these changes in comics. Technology had a lot to do with it, um, not just in terms of how we create comics, which we're going to show you in a minute here, but also in, in terms of how we actually get the production done. How do you get the pages to the publisher and stuff like that? Um, so. This phrase, Annihilation of Space, is one that I love. It's from the 19th century, and it came up a lot in research that we did for our last couple of books. And it refers to the period during which all these things that came along that suddenly, very suddenly, accelerated transportation, shipping, and communication uh, made people feel as if space was literally being annihilated, that things were closer together physically than they used to be, because it used to take you two weeks to get across the country. Now you can do it in three days. That was amazing. You can send a message you know, through these wires that can that reach the other person practically instantaneously. So this phrase was in very popular parlance in the 19th century, and I was thinking about it a lot while we were, um, while we were thinking about uh, uh, this presentation, um, because really that never stopped. It, ca it just continued. Things kept accelerating as our technology changed. So so for me, when I first came into the business, one of the things I was super thrilled by was that there was this recent company called Federal Express that would ship physical pages overnight across the country. This was amazing, because up until this time, if you wanted to work for Marvel DC, you had to live in New York City. Because the deadlines... Well, close enough to get there by train easily. Because anybody who's worked with deadlines understand you can work up to the last moment you take as much time as you can to, to, to do what you need to do. And so these artists would uh, like spend all night working on their pages and then and then get up... And <laughs> He's not speaking from personal experience at all. <laughs> and then, you know, walk out of the street, go down the street, get on the aisle, whatever, and go, get to the comic book publisher and deliver at 9 a.m. As, as they promised. But with uh, with these with this with this, this so changed everything. All of a sudden, these kind of, these comic book publishers and creators that it, that that had these new opportunities because of this new uh, direct market system didn't have to live in the towns where the companies were anymore. So, for instance, when we got to the invitation from Mike Richardson, publisher of Dark Horse, who's in the audience today, uh, it was no big deal for us to move halfway across the country because if I did need to work for DC Comics, it would be the same as if I was in Chicago. I could still send it with FedEx. So for decades, there were more comic book creators living in and around New York than anywhere else in the country because, because they had to physically drop stuff off. You might mail in a script, but even then, you didn't know exactly how long the mail was going to take. And certainly, most people were not mailing in their original art pages because who knows what may happen to them in the mail. So, so, so that was, it was, it was, 
insured, it was protected, like it, it all, you could do was cracked. So by the time Federal Express's network had really expanded in the 1980s, when we got into comics, by that point, people, you could really have a comic book publishing company located just about anywhere, and the creators were starting to be more geographic, geographically dispersed as well, and we lived and died by FedEx deadlines. I mean, I knew exactly what the FedEx deadline was for pickup at the office and for drop-off, and I knew where the late drop-off one was. And when we moved to the West Coast, I was shocked and dismayed to learn that it was two hours earlier because it's a different time zone. <laughs> right, looking at Chicago, I had sent pages to New York or DC. Uh, it was a five o'clock cutoff, but if I had to send pages to Dark Horse, which is in Oregon, it was a six o'clock. I had a whole other hour I could finish. Right, so that, that changed my entire editorial approach when we moved to, to the West Coast. Um, so one of the other things that came, the other things that came along during the 80s that started to change uh, the way that we delivered things and produced comics, fax machines. They're practically obsolete now for a lot of people, but oh my god, they were miraculous at the time. Because you just put something in there, and if there was a fax machine on the other end, they would get it right away. And you could write on it, you could do balloon placements, you know, you could make notes on a script and just fax it back to them instead of having to stick it in the mail or make a copy. Because you couldn't email file attachments yet, even when we got email, you couldn't send file attachments. Before artists and writers had a personal computer, they had a fax machine. Yeah, absolutely, and people would often fax in scripts. That would be the way that you would get your scripts, or and sometimes you would get the early stages of the artwork by fax for approval. Yeah, that was that was also a big deal. I remember um, watching a uh, uh, late 60s, 68, 69 movie, uh, Bullet with Steve McQueen, and there's an entire scene built around him and uh, you know, Napoleon Solo. They're standing in a room waiting for a fax to come in to San Francisco from New York, and they're waiting. And the tension is building. Is this the guy? It's a resolved line. You know, it's a line. So, um, so and believe it or not, that 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 Macintosh computer down there—that's what computers looked like when we first got computers at First Comics. Exactly like that. The screen was about this big, and it was magic. It was amazing. You couldn't save anything to the hard drive because there was no hard drive. <laughs> and you had to move every time to the office, but you could actually move things around. Um, so obviously, technology continued to evolve. We got the internet, we got email. Now we send around massive file attachments all the time. We stream live video on our phones. Um, but none of that existed yet in the 80s or even the early in the 90s. Um, it seems like the Stone Age. Yeah. Yeah, we lived in the Stone Then Federal Express hadn't even changed their name to FedEx yet. We all used to call them FedEx, and they actually struggled against it for a long time. And then finally, they were like, okay, we're FedEx. <laughs> All right, so this had a huge effect on a lot of different, uh, not only individual people, but cities across the country. Portland is a great example of this geographic dispersal in the, the diaspora out of, out of New York. So, uh, so Portland uh, already had Dark Horse Comics founded in 1986. Um, Oni Press uh, was started here in 1997. And it actually had its own local comic book convention, one of those really old school ones, since 1979, the Portland Comic Book Show. And not a lot of smaller cities had their own comic con at the time. Richard Finn, the guy who ran that, um, deserves a lot of credit for uh, really helping the people in the community here. Um, so, Portland is now home to a minimum at least four different publishers. Um, including Dark Horse, Oni, which was started by um, Bob Shrek, who uh, I used to work with in Dark Horse, Dark actually, Horse. another one of those tendrils. Uh, a little family tree going on. Uh, Top Shelf, which is now actually owned by IDW, which was also started by a former Dark Horse employee, so I guess Dark Horse owns everything now. <laughs> um, and Study Group Comics is actually a wonderful um, small press alternative publisher, and you can read a lot of their stuff uh, for free online on the web. Um, they do some really interesting material, and one of the guys involved in that also helps organized Line Work Northwest, which is one of the uh, festivals here in Portland. So Portland is also home to numerous comic book stores. Um, these, are, these are some of the major ones. Uh, Floating World Comics um, also occasionally publishes stuff. Oops, I went backwards, sorry. Uh, Portland is home to Helioscope Studio, which Paul is a founding member of. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Yeah, this is uh, uh, in 2003. <laughs> uh, David Hahn, Steve Leeper, Ron Randall, a few other guys got together, Rebecca Woods, uh, got together and um, decided to just have a little plug of us, uh, uh, a shared space, split the rent. This was when in the mid 90s? No, 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 2003. 2003, sorry. So, uh, so uh, this was a way for us to not be too misanthropic, because you know, the thing about freelancers, they're just all sitting alone and rolling out themselves doing their thing. This was a way for us to 
to just it's interact fairly, with humans. It's a fairly isolating type of work, and yet networking is crucial to it. So, so setting up a studio is a good way to try to resolve that. And then over the decade, we've 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 slowly assembled uh, people. Like people usually they show up as interns or you know, they submit portfolios and ask you know about membership. And so we've accumulated now two dozen people. And with the largest kind of company that we know of in the English speaking world. Studio. Studio. Yeah. <laughs> studio. Studio. Yes. And, and it's an arts collective. We don't do our own publishing. At one point, though, we did have the bragging rights to, under one roof, we had the, the, the artists working on Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Fantastic Four, and Spider Man. All were being drawn right out of here in Portland, Oregon, about half a dozen years ago. And a number of them also do very uh, wonderful creator creator own books, and several of them are featured in the show. Um, Colleen Coover, Dylan McConus, and Kat Harris um, are all featured on it and the exhibit. Uh, well, let me just finish this okay. slide. So, uh, and this is—I mean, this is this is a lot of stuff for a city this size. So, Portland currently has which, how many of these are still running? Uh, it currently has four comic book shows. That's a lot. Most towns only have one, if that. So, Rose City Comic Con is a fairly recent entry, but it's homegrown. It was started here. Uh, Linework Northwest is the smaller festival I mentioned, also relatively recent, and I think they're taking a year off, but it's a nice festival. Um, Artist Alley Comic Fest is in its second year, brand new, another homegrown effort. Uh, Wizard World Portland Comic Con is actually one of those things that started happening in the 90s and the early 2000s where people saw that there was money in certain markets and in certain aspects of the industry. Wizard, uh, Wizard World runs conventions all over the country and um, they finally came into the Portland market when they saw that three other conventions had been successful. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the reasons that, uh, well, actually, there's pretty much just one reason that, that Portland has wound up being the mecca of comics. There was a guy, uh, 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 industry writer, uh, reporter, named Thomas Berger, who sat down and worked out a list of all working comic book artists and writers, where did they live. No surprise, the number one is New York. Number two is Portland, Oregon, which means that per capita, this town has more comic book artists than any place on the planet Earth. It really is comic it's, city. Yes, right. and, and the reason for that is sitting in our audience right here today, Mike Richardson, publisher of Dark Horse Comics. In the 90s, he uh, started inviting town to come out and uh, not just work for his, his company, but to live here as well, because Portland, well, as we all know, is a great place to live. So slowly, like almost like a classic immigrant pattern, Kyle kind of Picard's came out, they loved it, they told their other kind of friends about it. Oh, the is there, we should move to Portland. So then all of a sudden, it, this, the snowball, which was pushed around the hill by Mike, turned into this giant avalanche. It reached critical mass, and then it just started like sucking in comic book artists and writers from all over the country. <laughs> That's right, yeah, the gravitational pull. Yeah, it was also, this This really took off during the 90s, at this, in the same period we're talking about where the industry was booming, oh, all the new audiences were coming in. Had the old FedEx, you didn't have to live, you know, in New York or LA. We started getting the email, Portland was still very, very affordable to live in at the time. So thank you, Mr. Richardson, for, for creating kind of city US. I gotta give Richard Finn some credit too, though, because he regularly brought in guests from out of town for this convention, and he always treated them extremely well, and they always left with a really good impression of Portland and economy. Comic book scene here. Um, so he did a lot to kind of spread that out into the world while Portland was still not that well known. There was no Portlandia yet. Um, so uh, I think there's one, two more things. All right, so recently, um, I think these people over here are from Portland State University, am I right? So um, well, PSU now has a comic studies program. This is a fairly recent development. There are, for many years, been classes taught there. There are classes taught at, at Portland Community College and other places in uh, in the area. But there's now a formal comic studies program at, uh, at Portland State University, which is uh, which I think is wonderful, especially considering the amount of talent we have here. Um, and, the other recent development is that the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund has relocated from New York to Portland, Oregon, Comic Book City, USA. They're a wonderful organization that advocates for um, free speech and have a lot of great uh, also resources um, about using comics in educational settings. Yeah, they, and each year they publish a thing called the Liberty Annual, which is an anthology comic featuring um, creators from the industry. And we have been honored to be participating in it this year. So that'll be coming out in the fall. 
so all of this, I mean, Portland is growing fast, but it's still not that big of a city. I mean, look how much is going on here. It's amazing. I mean, really, you almost can't swing a dead cat in Portland without hitting somebody who's got something to do with comics. <clears throat> Uh, so, one of the other areas in which technology had an enormous impact and continues to uh, is, of course, the way that we make comic books. So, this is, this is not our work, but this is a good example of the, the sort of basic stages of how a comic book page is made. You can also, if you go into the exhibit, one of the interactive touch screens has examples that show, uh, that show this type of process from a few different comic books. Do you want to walk us through the stages, Paul? Sure, yeah, the script stage, which is the scripts for comics are a hot scoop and a jump from screenplays, but with a little bit more detailed description. So on a screenplay, as you would, you would see the first shot, interior day, and then we'll leave it up to the production designer and art directors to figure out what that interior looks like. But for a comic book writer, usually they'll write it down. So you'll have a paragraph or two more than you would in a screenplay. And so then, we'll describe what's in the panel. This is for the artist to read, so it'll, it'll say what page it is, describe what's in the panel, and then write out the... There are different ways of creating comic books. This is called the full script method, where you write out the entire thing, and then the artist uh, draws it for And then so the penciler would be responsible for interpreting the script, choosing, let's say, to use a metaphor, choosing the camera angles, uh, choosing how the design of the page, how the eye floats across from panel to panel. And then the anchor picks up from there. Now, the reason it's even broken down into script pencils and inks right, is, is because of the schedule. Um, because if you want these books to come out in any kind of regular way, you have to break up these gigs. Otherwise, it's just going to take forever. It was an assembly line system that was developed for periodical comics um, early on because when you have to churn out the same title month after month after month after month after month, um, nobody can draw fast enough to do that forever. So they developed a way to break it down into different stages. So they would ship the pages, the original art pages, um, until we developed digital uh, ways of doing this. They would actually send the original art pages to the next person for the next stage. So if there is a penciler, and an inker, and a letterer, and a colorist, it would go to each one of those four different people, usually in succession, so that they could do their part. Then it would be sent on to the next person for them to do their stage. <laughs> Um, and at the time that we started in comics, uh, all of that was almost all of that was still being done physically. So everything was physically drawn. The paper is usually about this big. It was physically drawn on the paper by the penciler. Then it would go to the letterer, who would physically by hand draw the word balloons and the lettering on the page. And then, um, and then the anchor would go in because you don't want the ink first because then the push, it wouldn't work with the board. Right. If you were really running behind schedule, you would have the letterer do their lettering on a separate overlay while the anchor was inking the pages, and then you would have to have somebody in production cut them out and physically paste them onto the pages or onto a copy of the page. Um, so there was a lot of actual paste stuff going on. <laughs> Um, so when digital technology started to become inexpensive enough to be used in smaller publishing houses in the early 90s, uh, there wasn't yet enough processing power or memory for fully painted digital artwork. We also didn't have the tools for that really yet. The tools were still fairly clumsy. They were trying out all these different input devices like trackballs and you know weird things that you can wrap your hand around. Um, so some of the first areas where this technology were applied were in graphic design, lettering, and coloring. And these are early examples from a comic book I worked on at Dark Horse um, called Nexus: The Origin. And this, uh, the second image here is the inside front cover of that book, and that sort of just looks like normal design now. But in the early in the in the early 90s, it was like mind blowing that you could take an existing font and warp it to your will without having to redraw it by hand. I mean, that was brand new. I still can't like I have to actually put myself back in my my own shoes back then to remember how exciting that was. So you wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, you wouldn't have to do that all by hand. All that lettering would have had to be, have been drawn by hand. And a lot of people who are graphic designers don't have that kind of lettering skill. That is its own skill set. Um, so the designs got suddenly really interesting and then also like really overdone. Like people have gotten really carried away with layered designs. Good signs of your new Yeah. yeah. Um, the other areas that it started to become applied were in coloring. And that page there is one of the, it was colored on the very earliest uh, computer coloring system that Dark Horse had. Um, Photoshop was available at the time, but it was very expensive, as it still is. And it was actually pretty clunky compared to what it's like now. So Dark Horse had their own system. Um, 
And you can see that, like compared to some of the stuff that um, that we see in computer computer coloring now, it's pretty, it's kind of funky looking. Like it looked great at the time, and we were excited that my God, you can actually go in and change stuff just like you can with the design. It's amazing. And lettering was the other place where it really started to kick in. Comicraft is a company that was formed in the early 90s that is now one of the biggest sources for all different types of comic book uh, display and word balloon fonts. And they even sell fonts that were designed, a lot of artists have their own font in their own lettering style, and they will digitize your font, and if you're willing to sell it, you can make a little bit of, bit of money off of your own lettering style. Well, interesting sidebar, the, uh, uh, there had been experiments that trying to do machine fonts. Uh, EC Comics in the 1950s, their aura prime comics, they used their kind of machine font uh, that was unusual looking. And of course, when the digital revolution happened, and you could choose one of a million fonts to, to, to layer your comics in, it was quickly discovered that Word balloons specifically coming out of a person's mouth with the tail. To put a machine fund there makes it seem like they're a robot. That, 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 that uh, letters realized that even if you simulated it using a computer <coughs> font, it still had to look like it was hand written because the organic quality involved in the relationship between the text and the human subject. Uh, just you could people cannot let go of that. Yeah. So, so I think those expectations and traditions are changing a little bit, but it's still true that the more organic quality of hand lettering um, tends to you know tends to pull you in a little bit more rather than making it look like it was typed on the page. So the very first digital comic, uh, I actually did the production work on it because this is uh, the first time I was a staff artist there. It was called Shatter, and it was produced on those little Mac, that little Macintosh that we saw a few slides back. And so it, the, can you guys see that over? Can you see how pixelated the graphic is? quality? It's not like the eight-bit kind of thing, which has got a resurgence in video game, uh, that, that kind of boxy look. It was more like 1632-bit, but but nevertheless, you could see on the printed page the pix they had pixelated. You could see little squares all created. And this was a challenge that they had. This uh, comic was created by Peter Gillis and Mike Sains. And, uh, and, and the artist set himself the challenge, of, uh, and the publisher agreed that everything would be done on, on this t that teeny tiny little Macintosh screen that I showed you earlier, with no, with like no processing power. No but it turns out, you know, because there was no processing power, you could only do black and white. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do any digital color. So when they when they went to do a colored page uh, in the lower left hand corner, they had to use an analog process, which was an interim period between cutting film to create the four color plate press stuff that we're used to from old school comics. It was really bright colors. It was really bright colors. I mean, the, the, the way that she used to do it with for, for, uh, for uh, color printing is you would have CMYK, cyan, uh, magenta, uh, yellow. yellow. And, uh, and right, and so you would, but you'd only have 25% increment breaks on these. So if something was, if I was gonna color something, I would have to color it. 25% yellow, 50% yellow, or zero, or their combinations. 25% yellow, 75% red. Which is why there are no subtle colors yeah. or subtle color gradations in old comics right. because they only had like they only had like this, you know, increments like this to deal with. But then before the digital revolution, there was this little window, a little intern period, about five or ten years at most, where uh, because we're shooting analog, shooting a stat film, uh, it was figured out that when you shoot stat, when you shoot a black liner on a thing. Uh, snap film is has it's clear and black, so uh, all the ink lines are black and then the white is clear. And it was realized that you could take that, put it uh, put it on a, a piece of cardstock, a heavy piece of cardstock that was emulsified, and you burn in what's called a blue line. So you so you get so through photographic process you get on this cardstock a faint blue representation of the line work that you that you draw, and then you can use that to watercolor, to go in with watercolor. And, and it was blue because it was a specific, it was non-photo no, blue, so it doesn't, it does not reproduce on camera or on uh, photo. In case, case it's not on register because the blue would be Which always did. black. The blue, blue would be the blue black anyway. So, so for a little while, you would have these beautiful watercolor coloring that was going on by hand, but with a uh, stat camera, you know, like with the, uh, with, even with computer, uh, and with black line art black, uh, uh, over it, basically, and that was that. That was uh, that happened in the uh, late seventies and eighties, and that was the first time that hand colored comics with that type of subtle painted color um, were were being printed, and that was a huge change in the look of them. Um, and then with the advent of digital coloring, we were able to suddenly use these like one percent increments of colors and do all kinds of sophisticated blends eventually. And so now. 
digital illustration and coloring looks much more like what we see on the right side of the page here. Yeah, where you can you can create photorealistic effects. You can bring in using Photoshop. You can you know like for instance, a lot of artists use photo reference for what they draw. So you know, a person needs to draw a car. He'll look up on Google image search. He'll look, find the car he needs, and uh, quite often will trace over it in some way and you know add whatever you know add the illustrator's thing. But Eventually, people like myself and, and others who are playing with Photoshop realized you don't have to draw uh, from reference. You can draw right over the reference and manipulate the reference itself and create a uh, much more dimensional and interesting photorealistic quality. And is that how you do stuff like this? Uh, right, like, 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 the, like the, the, the thing where uh, this, this woman is sitting on one of the plate's shoulders and shooting at the fish, these evil monster fish coming at them. Like, for instance, for the reference for that, I used um, a photograph of a koi being fed in a koi bar, and, and then manipulated and used layers and stuff like that to create a completely different effect. So you can, so the tools have just a wide open. And of course, every artist has uses these tools in a different way. So the uh, in the upper right is uh, some artwork by Mike from Window um, that's completely digital, that's full digital painting. I mean, it's gorgeous. And the two pages on the bottom are, uh, are black line art, like he was talking about, with digital coloring uh, by Matt Holling stores. And you can see you can get some much more sophisticated effects than you could when, when uh, the good first started. And, this, and the color percentage works in general. There was a huge sea change in the night, in the early, in the knots, when uh, tablet and stylus technology developed. So, so that you no longer had to use a track ball to try to get your... Or a mouse. Can you imagine drawing those uh, pages from Shatter with a really old mouse? <laughs> so, so now all of a sudden you, had, you went all the way back to, you know, to put pirates and sticks. And you went right back to the status where you could have that familiar sensation of drawing on a tablet that would then reproduce it on screen. So you could, do, you could uh, have different brushes, styles, different effects. All of a sudden we went back to our traditional and then ink or pen and then pixel. So now we have new tools that enable this type of, uh, we have drawing tablets, we have software that is designed specifically for making comic books. There's a whole software package called Manga Studio now um, that's designed for making comic books. People used to have to cobble things together from whatever software they happen to have. People did a lot of stuff in Photoshop and still do a lot of coloring in Photoshop. Um, and even things like Photoshop have tools like built-in brushes where you can do these amazing effects and patterns and stuff. Um, but it's funny, we still see people reinventing some of the old techniques without realizing it sometimes. We went to an art show um, by a local artist named uh, Jonathan Case, uh, who's super talented, and he was showing his original art from The New Deal, I think it was, a graphic novel that he did. And, uh, and what he had done was he had basically printed blue lines like Paul was talking about. So, so he took this acetate, this clear plastic overlay, and the black line art was printed on it. And then he had an artboard underneath it that he had done a beautiful blue watercolor wash on because it was all printed in these tones of blue. And, and, I, and, and I was talking to him and I said, hey, you did those like blue lines. And he said, like what? Because he's younger than us. Blue lines, what are those? So he, didn't, he reinvented the wheel without knowing that the wheel existed, basically, which I thought was really cool. So it's interesting that those types of techniques still have application even in the digital age. Uh, never throw out the baby with the bathwater. All right, so um, this is just an example of another type of digital, uh, digital artwork that Paul has done. Um, this is from our 2005 graphic novel, um, Heartbreakers Meet Boilerplate. This is an example of what I'm talking about with photographs, because you can see who modeled for, uh, for my character here. Uh, and you can see the, the, uh, the upper left of thumbnails um, of four, four separate pages. Uh, so what you're seeing here on the right, the middle page, is that upper right corner. Oh, we have, we have this thing. Oh, we have a corner. Look at that. So this page is this here. And this page, as you can see, the pointer is the same. Okay. And it's I included this partly because um, that earlier process like does, didn't show the thumbnail stage, which is a very common stage for illustrators. And it's also one of the things that is very often still done by hand. You can do it on the computer, but a sketch pad will do just as well. And when you're like, if you can actually draw like he can, when you're trying to work out the structure and the layout and the pacing of your story, I think it's just faster to do it like that, probably. And then you can just go, you can redo it on the next page or erase it and go back. I mean, it is. Uh, so that's, not everything's digital. But that's part of my my generational thing. I'm just more comfortable with physical uh, materials. Like uh, some of my younger uh, studio mates in their twenties. 
they will just, they'll have like their little sketch pads or iPads or things like that. In fact, Wacom has just come out with a, a new kind of uh, sketch pad that uses physical paper and you can use a pen, draw on the paper, and underneath the stack of paper, underneath the metal stack, is a sensitive screen that's translating your drawing out of a piece of paper into a computer version of it. So you have both. You can tear off the actual physical sheet of paper with a drawing on it, give it to somebody, and press a button, and that thing will be sent to a file. So that's my next toy. <laughs> so we have all these different tools available to us now. Um, all right, one of the other, actually one of the biggest technological changes has come along very recently, and this is, uh, and this comes, goes along with the internet, um, and that's a big change in the way that it's possible to distribute and sell your comics um, through the web. Uh, so there's still plenty of people printing comics, paper print is not dead, paper comics are still out there, but um, they're increasingly popular on um, two different types of uh, uh, digital comics, and the terminology is usually web comics and digital comics, and the main distinction is that a web comic is almost always free to read, and it's usually posted in fairly small increments, like the person who does it usually does most of it themselves, they'll post a page a week or as often as they can manage it. Yeah, these are usually labor of loves, things that somebody's doing on the weekend, at night, in their spare time. And interestingly, web comics, uh, there are a lot of web comics that have enormous audiences that are almost completely separate from the print comics audience. So it's another way in which the audience was expanded outside of that direct sales market that we were talking about. And there's a little bit of overlap there, but there are all, like now all these different people reading comics in different forms, which is exciting. Yeah. The, uh, uh, digital comics, really the main distinction is that that's a comic book that's much more like a traditional comic book, except it's in digital form. You pay for it, uh, you either download it and read it on a mobile device, or you can read it on your computer or laptop. Um, for people like us, the advantage of that type of comic is that we already have a lot of paper in our basement. Like, a lot. I still have comics from the 70s and 80s in the basement. I don't need everything in paper anymore. My retailer friends probably hate me now, but I still go to comic shops, and I still buy things in print, but only the things that I like, really, really, really want to own in print. You know, the web has completely rewritten the rules about how you break into comics. I, I used to be asked this question all the time. And there used to be a series of procedures that you would have to go through. You may put your samples in a manila envelope and mail them to the publisher that you feel is appropriate for that stuff. And they would have these publishers who have what they call a slush pile, a pile of these pimple envelopes from all kinds of people wanting to uh, pitch, pitch their, either their art or their comic. And, um, and then at a certain point, publishers started putting out uh, guidelines. You have to jump through these hoops and add hoops before we look at your piece or whatever. But with the web, if you, if you have the, the gumption, you, should, you can just take your material, put it on the web, get your URL, send it around, drive people to the site, and if the material is good, I mean, if it's, if it's well written and drawn, it will find an audience. And, and you can build an audience yourself without going through a distributor, without going through a publisher, anything like that. It's uh, like the, the rules of yeah, in fact, we were on a panel earlier today where somebody pointed out that um, there's a new graphic novel out from, I think, Harper Collins called Nimona um, that's wonderful and that's getting a lot of attention. That was initially done by a college student as a webcomic uh, just because she had to get it out of her system. Um, and I remember reading it when it was online as a webcomic, and it's very powerful. Uh, unfortunately, that one you, you can no longer read for free online, but um, you can find a graphic novel. But I, I remember that while well, first that started to happen, and so my studio they took advantage of this, and they started just putting page after page, week after week. I'm like, we're just gonna put it out there for, for free. For free? That's yeah. crazy. And, and what I found out was... We don't make any money in comics anyway. It's bad enough as it is. But um, what I found was is that people who are, who are interested in it and who would come back and want to read the next page and the next page, they were interested in it enough to then when it was eventually collected into a physical thing, that they would go and they would buy it because they wanted to have a physical copy, they wanted to support the artist. I mean, as awesome as the web is, and I love it, there's something to be said for the tactile, tactile sensation of having a physical object. True. And so that uh, this diversity of format and diversity of content uh, means that bookshelves or graphic novels no longer look like that. That's what I meant when I said they used to all be the same size, and they were all that size because they were the same dimension of the comic book. Yes. Um, to looking more like that. So you can already see, like, even if you 
can't see the titles, you can see how many different shapes and sizes there are. You can tell that there's a lot of different types of subject matter. Um, and you can also tell that at least one of those shelves is in a library, which is great to see. Yes. Um, so along with the diversity in the different types of technology and the different formats, um, we are getting a lot more diversity in content, again, like we talked about earlier. Um, so these are just uh, the, at the same time that all this has been happening, the audience has been widening. And there's also been a growing conversation about diversity in comics. You may have noticed that on the first slide that was in pop culture in general. And pop culture in general, true. On the first slide that we used, the title slide, we had uh, there was an image of the comic book guy from The Simpsons, who for a long time that was the stereotype, either that or like the Big Bang Theory, like nerdy glasses. You know, that was the stereotype. It was usually a white guy, and they were usually really nerdy. They were often overweight, and that was what everybody thought of when they thought of comic book fans. And it's not like that anymore. Sure, there's, I mean, it was never exclusively like that, let me be clear. Um, but it was predominantly uh, white and male for quite a long time. Um, and that has changed a lot. Uh, if there are now, um, there's pretty good numbers showing that uh, the gender split is almost 50, it's about 50-50. There are a lot more women reading comics and making comics. There are a lot more people of color reading comics and making comics and also pushing the bigger publishers to change. The smaller publishers, the independent and small press comics already were putting out a lot more diverse material. Um, Marvel and DC, the bigger ones, were very reactive and very slow to change. We, when I was working with Friends of Lulu in the 90s, um, we were pushing really hard to try to get them to do more material that would appeal to a broader audience, and their answer was always very circular. It would be, well, women don't read comics, or, or kids don't read comics um, as much as they used to, so we're not going to make comics for them. And we would say, but if you don't make them, how can we beat them? So finally, here we are 20 years later, guess what? It turns out we were right. Women do read comics, kids read comics. There's more stuff coming out for a wider age range again. Uh, the Eisner Awards, which are the Oscars of comics, have added entire categories for younger reader books, which is really great because, as I said earlier, there was a dearth of that type of material for a long time. Actually, this year, uh, I was the presenter at the Oscars of the comics industry, and one of the things that we were talking about backstage was was that the few superhero titles that actually did win some awards were offbeat creator, uh, creator vision takes on industry, um, on these industry characters. Like, for instance, one of the... One yeah, of the, very few nominations are awards for the uh, for the big publishers. Right, yeah. Superhero a, lot of, a lot of the top awards went to independent uh, publishers and creators, so it was... It was it's, it was very impressive to see. So these are only a few, um, you know, sort of well-known uh, recent examples of the new diversity and the content of characters in the audience. Um, Marvel actually uh, has a superhero character who is a young Muslim woman, which is amazing. Um, and many of these, uh, many of these comics are also written or created by people who are from that culture. So, uh, Turning Japanese is a wonderful memoir. We also have a number of different genres represented here. Uh, by a Japanese American woman, um, Shaft, uh, which was a, uh, based off the uh, the black exploitation movie of the '70s, is written by a local writer, African American writer David Walker. Um, Soldier's Heart, wonderful memoir by Carol Tyler, uh, that's fairly experimental in form but very easy to read. It's about getting to know her father and trying to learn about his experiences in World War II that he never wanted to talk about. Um, El Defo, which is a wonderful uh, uh, cartoon younger readers book about a deaf character. Uh, Persepolis, which was also turned into an animated movie, which is about um, growing up in Iran. And March, which is one I think two Eisner's so far, uh, which was done with the participation of Congressman John Lewis, which is about the civil rights, the, uh, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. So you can see, like, it's not just like it's no, it's so far beyond superheroes right now, and uh, it's just an incredibly exciting time, and every time I think I think about how much has transpired over the last 30 years, um, I get uh, I get simultaneously happy for the kids who are reading comics and a little bit jealous too. Yes, because we didn't have this kind of acceptance when we were in the comics. When we were kids. <laughs> and I didn't know any other girls who read comics when I was a kid, so I'm excited that there's so many of them out there now. Um, so that is that is more or less an overview of how we got uh, how we got from that the narrow down superhero period to where we are now with this amazing diversity of content uh, and uh, and format and creators. And does anybody have any questions based on what we talked about or anything we else? Have a, we have a few minutes uh, to take some questions. Anybody that's interested? Questions? Yes. Uh, with the resurgence of ideas of work, 
Yes, there is. There are. I mean, he was talking about uh, Native American comics. There, there is um, uh, an imprint, actually. I forget the name of it. Uh, that's that's being run by Native Americans, and they're yeah, they're starting to do their own stories. There's a uh, the Mexican comic scene is really exploding right now. Uh, it, it, it after through, its own implosion. After its own implosion, it went through its own implosion. Um, but uh, that's really uh, come into its own. And even though I'm a total radio, my next project is going to be about uh, the Aztec Empire. So, uh, so we're going to start just, it's, it's, it, again, it's, um, it's, the web has made all this amazing stuff available, but like, like everything, like all the like politics and, and anything else to choose the web for in terms of information, you have to kind of seek it out. You have to be proactive about finding these things. Do, do we have one other question? Mm -hmm. Like back there? I believe it's a, actually they can tell you more about that than right. I can. I believe it's a certificate program, and I don't think it's in. Uh, actually, you should ask them. They don't want to misspeak. Um, <laughs> do you want to come up here and tell us about the program? Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 Um, so the program is called Back Program. So for people who already have their bachelor's degree, it's a six-course program. Uh, one course is required as a theory pro, the comic books theory course is amazing. Um, and then the other five courses are, um, they range from actual art courses to writing comic books, and all of the courses are taught by either our um, professors at, at PSU or local artists um, and presenters like Brian Michael Bendis is one of our uh, instructors, Douglas Wolf is one of our instructors, Steve um, Shannon Wheeler is also an instructor. Yeah, and Shuts, who was a uh, editor at Dark Horse for, for years, is also um, teaches the history of comic books class. Uh, the program is spectacular and it's so exciting to be able to have in an academic setting justification for my reading comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> my parents finally accept it. <laughs> All right, and that's Oklahoma oh. State University, and you can get more information that they're at the other table right here. I think we can take one more question right yeah. now. Yes. When you look at a graphic novel, Kind of looks like your target audience is people who are working 300 pages of print. <laughs> Well, the graphic novels tend to be around 100, 100 pages. Yeah, that's, that's well, they actually they, they require a little bit of a different read, a different type of reading. Um, so you know how they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I don't know if I would go that far. I wouldn't say every comic book panel expresses a thousand words. But but if you're only reading the words, you're you're really not getting the, the full story. So so when you when you read comics, you tend to. Uh, it depends. Some people read the words first, and some people look at the pictures first. But you're you're really looking at both of them, and you're getting different information out of both of them. Ideally, they're additive, so the words are telling you something that you don't necessarily get from the picture, but the picture has its own additional information in it. Yeah, a good a good tell is turn quickly if you, you're reading a, a well-written comic is to see if the caption is describing what you see in the panel, because it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, one other question. Well, the, the yes. Good question. Where did the term comic come from? Why are they called comic books, even though they're not always funny? Right. Well, the original what we what we call comic book books, the uh, sort of satisfied floppy. That the the very first ones were reprints of newspaper strips. So somebody in the in the in the 1930s uh, had access, you know, on all these different comic strips, or uh, and and decided, uh, well, let's, we're not making any money just these newspapers that the next day are used as you know, about your bird cage, is there a way that we can take all this material, reprint it, not pay anybody anything, again, not have to lay out any money except for the printing costs. And so the first comic books were essentially just reprints of the comic strips, and, the, and, and, and they, they had titles like Fun, Comics, Things like that. Yeah, so I, I think I think most of them were actually comical when they started out, yeah. um, and then and then the and then the term just stuck. Basically. Actually, that was one of the reasons that Batman 
hit so hard and so big so fast. This is that at that time, the, the darkest amounts you get would be maybe, you know, the fantastical measures of Mandrake the Magician, or one of these new stars of Phantom, you know, or something like that that was pretty low key. But Batman was, that was took directly from the much more adult oriented pulp magazines, which were just gross with an occasional illustration of like Well, sure. certainly more, more violent and blood. Absolutely. Yeah. So, they were mostly the kids. But. Right, right, right. So, so Batman and, uh, was, was this, um, was taken from outside of newspapers, just was taken from the pulps. So that's what sort of redirected comics. And in fact, the term graphic novel um, was developed partly because in the 80s, when, when there was this whole new wave of uh, new types of comics and new publishers, people were going, well, how are we going to get people to take us more seriously with any like, comic books? We should call it something else. And you would not believe how many different terms were, were being bandied about at the time. There were an awful lot of them, and there are still people who are advocating for terms other than graphic novel. And people were, there was a like, concern that, like, are people going to think it's like X-rated because it says graphic in the title, you know? <laughs> So now that one's apparently stuck, so now we've got comic books and graphic novels. Um, but that's a good question. They actually were mostly money when they right. when the medium first started. Yeah, yeah. It started out as a humor, as humor reprints. All right, well, I think that's oh, time. Can we take one more question? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, in your sort of traditional presentation of how these were developed, it looked like you had four different people probably working on four different stages. Right. And I was wondering if, okay, that, it sounds like that's changing. Well, um, it's it, done different ways. It depends. Like, for instance, the monthly comics come out every month. They still have to have that assembly line system. So all the major superhero publishing, all titles like Superman and Batman and those things, still have that assembly line process. But the, some of the independent comics, especially ones where the publisher editor can give the time it takes to an individual creator, they will give that and say, okay, it's going to take them um, six weeks, six months, whatever it is, to, to produce that issue, and we'll schedule it that way. Also, there are some creators who are better at doing all those different parts of it than others, and some who have a very particular personal vision, and they're usually referred to as cartoonists, which is which is weird. In, in the industry, they're called cartoonists as opposed to pencilers or inkers, because penciling and inking are fairly narrow, narrowly defined skills, and Somebody who's a good penciler might not be the greatest inker, but another penciler might be, might be an awesome inker. There's a lot of variation there. But so I flip, flip back here because things like um, Turning Japanese, Mario Naomi's book, um, that is done by a single person who has their own creative vision, and it's a memoir, and it's a very personal story. So it tends to be kind of, it's usually either one or the other. Either there's a whole team that does it, or it, the team can vary in size or it's one person who does practically everything on the book, and it's a single vision creator. Right, like for as an example, the next project that I plan on doing, I will be writing it, and I'll be drawing the preliminary parts, the layouts and the thumbnails, and then I'll have a friend of mine who's, who's, uh, whose style is similar to mine, who, who, who we connect to in terms of aesthetic level, and he'll do what I call the heavy lifting, determine body posture and clothing folds and expressions, and then I'll go back in and, and color it. And, and do little corrections, little things that, that I think he missed. Or but meanwhile, he thinks you're doing the heavy lifting by doing the layouts because he doesn't like doing the layouts. Because he loves to do like clothing folds and postures and expressions. He doesn't like to try and conceive where do I put the camera? How does the eye flow across? How do I design this? Yeah. So there's a lot of flexibility in how those creative relationships work depending on the preferences of the individual creators, the working relationship, how much time they have in their schedule, whether they're doing one you know, big book or a whole bunch of uh, issues that are going to come out monthly. So, good question, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, this was fantastic. Thank you all. And I do want to mention for folks who are collectors, next Sunday we'll have a program called What's It Worth? And this room will be filled with folks who can evaluate your collected items, including toys and comics. Um, so if you'd like to come in and get some estimates, come in. Thanks.
gets the chance. I got the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 